And module seven is all about the joys of file dynamics. So quick introduction to myself. I'm Finley McGuire. I'm an assistant professor at Dalhousie University, jointly appointed in computer science and community health and epidemiology, despite having a microbiology background. Um, and I'm also pathogenomics bioinformatics lead for the shared hospital lab in Toronto, which is based at the Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre, which is a very large medical microbiology lab where we do lots of sequencing, COVID and otherwise, and work with many of the fine other faculty today. Um, okay, so today we're going to do recovering a caveat we're covering a lot of area right file dynamics is a very big topic there they could very easily could be and in fact there is entire workshops dedicated to just put out aspects of file dynamics so we're going to have a high level overview of file dynamics as well as a couple of kind of different types of modeling techniques as well as a couple of different types of analysis so we'll look at temporal inference looking at spatial trait inference looking at some epidemiological parameter estimation and looking at some inference of kind of evol evolutionary pressures and forces, such as selection. Uh, and the lab practical, we're going to look again at some of these kind of file dynamic analyses. We're going to do them using a small data set involving zoonoses in SARS-CoV-2, um, which several people in the in the uh, I noticed in the attendee list are familiar with, and I think we're uh, we're actually on the paper uh, looking at time estimation, ancestral state reconstruction, and that selection testing. So. You want to understand epidemiological dynamics of infectious diseases. You're all masochists and you really want to understand what, what is happening with the disease, how is it happening over time. And I noticed from, again, some of your backgrounds uh, yesterday, or the first day on the introduction, some of you are coming from this epidemiological world rather than the genomics and microbiology world. So that some of this will be very familiar with you. Um, so generally, one of the kind of go-to tools we do for modeling infections and their dynamics really focuses entirely on the human side and the cases. And so we, these, these compartmental models known as SIR models in some cases, and essentially the idea is we just have the number of people in the susceptible category that could get infected. We have uh, some degree of parameter beta, an infection rate that, uh, that transitions the number of people into the infectious category. And then some kind of parameter for how quickly people recover. And then, you know, they might be immune for a while or some cases, you know, they might get susceptible again. And disclaimer, this is pretty much the simplest, one of the simplest compartmental models there is. And it's kind of the archetypical initial Kermak McKenna kind of first model that was developed. So this, these kind of models, we generally, yeah, so we have S as the number of susceptible individuals each time, I, the number of infectious individuals, R, the number of recovered and ceased immune individuals at any given time. And then we use, depending on your background, either some scary or some very familiar and simple differential equations to model the dynamics over time of how the number of people in each of those categories changes, right? And again, these two key parameters, this beta and this gamma, keep coming up in these, these equations because they determine how people are moving between these categories. And so we can, we can calculate those parameters, right? We can calculate those values for beta and gamma from observed cases. We can, use, we can use a likelihood approach like we dealt with in phylogenetics where we can say, you know, what's the probability given observed, certain observed case, di case dynamics, like, you know, the number of cases over the pandemic for a given value of beta and gamma. A simple example of this is like, you know, would be like, okay, you toss, you, to you toss a coin 20 times, you get 20 heads. You can ask yourself, what is the probability of 20 heads given it's a fair coin, probably pretty low, right? So that's a likelihood. That's all, that's the entire basis of how likelihoods work. So we can use likelihood approaches to fit these, these values onto our case count data, right? So why are, so if we can do all that from our case count details, if we can kind of build these kind of classic epidemiological models by which we kind of model the dynamics of an infectious outbreak or a pandemic, why do we need genomic data? Why is genomic data useful? Why is genomic epidemiology a thing? Which I hope some of you were starting to understand now by this point in the course. Well, the great thing about genomes is they can be used to infer unobserved events, right? So especially early in an epidemic or early in an outbreak, we might not have any cases. We might not actually have well-controlled case data. I mean, look at all, you know, look at the discussion about the origin of SARS-CoV-2. A lot of, a lot of the, beyond the larger political debate and conspiracy theories and all that kind of mess, one of the big challenges is we just don't have a lot of data about that early out of those early outbreaks. We have a lot more data than we would have for many data sets, for many outbreaks in the past, 
but we still have a limited amount of data. So how do we work out things about that unobserved area of an outbreak? How do we work out those, you know, wh when did it start? What kind of basic uh, reproduction numbers? So the, the ratio of the kind of how many secondary cases are caused from each case It's related to those parameters I showed, those beta and gamma parameters in that SIR model. Without, how do we do that when we don't have, when we didn't, weren't collecting case data at the time? And the answer is we can actually use genomic data to kind of fill in the things we didn't see. We can infer what those previous states were, what these th historical things that we didn't directly observe by looking at the relationship between some of the genomes and some of the modeling methods we're going to talk about today. The other thing that genomes are really great for is they tell us explicitly who infected whom, right? And they tell us the population structure of things. So on the left here, on the right here, we have a, a transmission network, right? So these red dots are when an infection starts. And you see, so this person here got infected, they're infected, they're infected, they're infected, they're no longer infected. But meanwhile, they infected two other people, right? This affected this person, this affected this person. And then, you know, that person's infected for a period of time. They can infect other people and so on and so forth, right? And so we can, we can you know, use epidemiological data. We can use the kind of classic epi approaches, case linkage, all that kind of stuff to try and infer this transmission network based on, okay, there's two people that were in the same space at the same time and both got sick. They were probably, one probably infected the other. You know, that, that's a reasonable kind of classic epi approach. But with genomic data, we can often directly kind of investigate that. We can test that theory. We can see whether this person likely infected another person or not. Uh, we can tell more about the kind of population structure. Again, we can see the cases. We can learn something about the cases we didn't see, we didn't sample by using genomic data. The other thing is the case information itself doesn't really tell us much about the pathogen evolution. So with any infectious disease, and you know, as we, we heard about today, we heard about AMR, we saw the evolution of resistance. We've talked about phylogenetics. You know, evolution is a huge component of infectious disease. It's kind of one of the things that makes it not special, but it's one of the kind of features of it that is important to investigate, important to pull out, that leads to it changing and uh, moving about over time. And this evolution happens at lots of different scales, which adds to a lot of complexity. You know, we have, you know, within the multiple copies of a given genome within a single cell, they're going to have different mutations present. They're going to have different mutations occurring, different slight selection. We're going to have, you know, happening within organs in the body, within the, the host as a, a whole, evolution happening between hosts, or even in the case of like zoonoses and multiple, you know, multiple between different species. So all of that's going to lead to these differences in dynamics and different changes over time, right? And without genome evolution, without genomes, we can't access that evolutionary information, right? Genomes are the substrate of that evolution. So unless we're looking at the genomes, we have no way of really analyzing and inspecting that in any detail. Sure, we might see something like, oh, something changed about the pathogen. There's a lot more cases all of a sudden. But we don't know why, and we don't know whether maybe that was just a super spreader event, right? So unless we're getting the genome data and using some of the methods that we're talking about in this workshop, we're not going to be able to access that evolution. Okay. So I've made the case that epidemiology, you know, epidemiology is a useful thing. Learning about disease dynamics is a useful thing. We can learn self about cases, but genomes can give us much richer information to things we don't see, as well as, you know, more complex bits of the relationship between pathogens, how they're changing over time. So how do we actually link genomes to epidemiology? Well, as Fiona showed us, uh, Dr. Brinkman showed us on uh, in module two, we can infer a phylogeny from genomic data. So say we've got six genomes here, and these dots represent, say, SNPs. So, you know, C has this pink mutation. It's the only one with this pink mutation. All of them have these light green mutation here. A and B have this purple mutation, have an orange mutation, and so on and so forth. We can use the pattern of the mutations, the sharing of them between, and a variety of different approaches, maximum likelihood, as, as talked about in the, that module, as well as parsimony, distance measures, and so on, as well as... Uh, to infer that tree. So here's like, you know, the simple parsimony approach of the simplest explanation being, okay, they all share this green mutations. So that probably happened earlier on, right? So it doesn't really let us split any of these apart into our branching tree structure. Okay, but here, okay, D doesn't have any more mutations. So we branch that off. And here we have A, B, and C in purple, and E and F, they share different sets of mutations. So they probably form separate branches. 
um, E and F here, we can split it off again. E and F, uh, you know, because the EF has this extra mutation that E doesn't have. A, B, and C, we might split off again based on this orange and pink mutations. And so we can use that pattern of mutations to build phylogenetic trees that show us the evolutionary relationships between the samples. Um, I want to say this is this is this, this is a simple parsimony example. You know, maybe there's some of these mutations that actually occur lots of times. Maybe this green mutation actually occurred independently on every single one of these branches. You might have other information that might support that. So this is you know not a guaranteed way, but the general principle is you can use that pattern of mutations with some degree of modeling, ideally, and prob dealing with probability, dealing with uncertainty, dealing with under prior information about how common certain mutations are. How commonly are mutations lost again? Do you get see reversion um, to generate phylogenetic trees? But but what does what does this tree actually represent? Like when you see a phylogenetic tree, what does it actually represent? And especially in the context of infectious disease, this is something that kind of key principle. And Dr. Taboda kind of talked about this a bit with the kind of the whirlwind figures and stuff like that with the uh, subtyping. So. Uh, an individual phylogenetic tree represents a sampling from the underlying process. So in the case of infectious diseases, quite often the underlying process we're interested in is that underlying transmission network. So again, these, this is the pattern of, okay, of all these, all these dots are a person becoming infected or an animal or whatever. And then these, these uh, vertical lines are transmission they're when they're infecting someone else, right? And so what, what we have when what you have those A, B, C, D, and F is we have samples we've taken from this process. So the blue, the light blue here, those are the genomes. So there where we've taken a swab from somebody and we've sequenced it and we've got the we've done all the work that Dr. Simpson talked about, you know, variant calling, mapping to the reference, getting a genome out, consensus sequence out at the end. And so we have a sampling of these, of this process. So you have these light blue dots. And then what basically what we're doing with the phylogeny is they're the bits we're observing. And then the phylogeny is essentially is a kind of blurry view back onto that transmission network. So here's, here's the transmission network with our samples. And here's just the samples. Here's just the parts we see directly. And with a little bit, and, and you know, this is, okay, yeah, there's a little bit of kind of lines that don't really look like a normal phylogeny, but if we just tidy that up a little bit and we just straighten everything, look, we have a phylogeny, right? So a phylogeny is just a sampling of this underlying process. So the next question is, what determines the shape of this underlying process? What determines that transmission network? And the answer is there's many different forces that determine the shape of that underlying transmission network that then we're getting a blurry view of with our phylogeny. So can anyone turn on, this is the most short interactive component, but if anyone wants to turn off their microphone, turn on their microphone and just shout out some examples of things that might determine the shape of an underlying transmission network. Mutation. Yeah, mutation rate could be one of them. Latency period. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the, so the, the, the type of virus we're dealing with and the kind of disease um, yeah, cause... exactly. So like long-term infections, short-term infect, like short-term infections, um, something that causes a very se immediate severe disease versus a long asymptomatic disease. A hundred percent. Yeah. Interventions like public health interventions. Extremely. Yeah. It's going to have a huge impact. And actually there's a really, really nice seminar done in Switzerland but from, I think from Tanya Sadler's group showing how you can use some of the methods I'm going to talk about today to actually evaluate the public health interventions and how well they actually worked. Anything else? Behavior and contacts networks. Yeah, both Yeah, both in terms of animals and in terms of humans and, you know, all those aspects of human, human population structure, you know, how immunologically similar are everyone in a population? Getting access to a, a naive population causes a big random, a big burst of infection, as we saw when China lifted some of their restrictions. We had a huge number of cases and that's going to be reflected in that underlying transmission network in the shape of that. Immune escape mutations. Yep, massively, right? So again, similar, the similar thing. It's going to, those mutations are going to lead to changes. It's going to change the dynamics of the disease. And again, that's going to be reflected in the shape of the transmission network. So I'll, 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 uh, I'll say, keep thinking of things. <laughs>
you went on mute. I just muted myself yeah sorry <laughs> um, I don't know habits after speaking um so yeah so here's just a you know, subset of those examples some of which should be mentioned uh generation time again well it's a pathogen how quickly how quickly new copies are made um population structure vaccination post migration people moving around when we saw lockdown nationally we actually saw an interesting thing that we hadn't seen infectious disease for a long time which was structured populations based on individual countries geography but generally movement and uh, flights and stuff like that have led to a more mixing up globally in that sense uh, all that evolution aspect so so the underlying process is a combination of ecological factor factors epidemiological factors and evolutionary factors both in the host and the pathogen though we're mostly going to be focusing on the pathogen today so all of, what file dynamics is, is the process about learning, is learning about this process from the shape of the phylogeny. Got a, we've, got a, we've got the underlying process, we're sampling from it, we're building a phylogeny from that, that gives us a blurry view back onto that original process. So by looking at the shape of the phylogeny and, de and modeling things based on that shape, we can start to unpick and un unmix some of that mess of that underlying process. So all file dynamics is, is kind of trying to go back from the phylogeny to try and work out aspects of that underlying process and some degrees vice versa. So let's start with the kind of the sim simple part of file dynamics, the simple idea here and the kind of simple end analysis, which you'll see is not necessarily simple, of trying to reconstruct a transmission network from the phylogeny. So not dealing with any of those kind of complex features and epidemiological features and, and uh, evolutionary features, but literally just going from the phylogeny back to that underlying transmission network. And so what this, this is tends to be, this the problem with this is it's very complicated by the fact of transmission biologically represents a kind of sampling of a sampling, right? You have diversity within your, within your body of pathogen. With SARS-CoV-2, relatively little intra-host diversity compared to other pathogens. Uh, certainly in short-term infections rather than long-term infections. But you're still, when you know, if you cough on somebody when you have SARS-CoV-2, which ideally you're not because you're using good, uh, <laughs> you're being sensible and masking when you're ill and avoiding contact. But, uh, you know, if you cough on someone else, they're going to get a subsampling of the internal diversity of your SARS-CoV-2, right? And so, and depending on when you infect somebody. So this person here, may get infected by a different subset of the virus in this person than this person. And, you know, here's another kind of view on that. You know, we see infection, homogenous population at the beginning, because, you know, what small number of viruses have caused it. Get di diversity appearing over time and during that infection. And then depending on someone infects, they might transmit a different subset of that diversity. Or they might even transmit a mixed infection. You might transmit more, more than one at a time. So transmission is a sample. So when we're looking at this transmission network from a phylogeny, really it's a sampling of a sampling. So that adds a lot of uncertainty to these inferences. And so we end up with a situation where the same tree, so here we have five different, we have the same tree, five, we have the same tree that, can, that could actually be explained by five different transmission scenarios. So here we have, a tree, here we have A infecting B infecting C. So we have A as the base as this kind of ancestral status, that's then infecting B, then infecting C. Whereas over here we have, say, A infecting B and C. So A, A is this kind of ancestral state here and here, infecting B and C. You know, here we have the opposite. We have B as the ancestral state infecting A and A and C. So the same phylogeny can be consistent with multiple different transmission networks. But some of those are more going to be more likely. They're going to be more probable than others, right? We can build in some of the things we understand about intra-host diversity. We can build in how we know how infectious a given pathogen is. But we need a framework in order to handle all of that uncertainty and incorporate that into our estimates when we're trying to do this reconstruction. And so the solution to that is something called is probabilistic. Is something called probabilistic inference it's using pr these probabilistic methods, like the maximum likelihood approach we talked about with phylogenetics. Uh, in the file genetics module. And so a lot of file dynamics tends to be based on a very useful probabilistic inference framework known as Bayesian inference, Bayesian file genetics. And again, 
this these are whole these are whole you know modules courses graduate courses could be done on just just Bayesian modeling of phylogenies by itself, let alone the phylogenomics aspect. So this is just a very high level idea of what is going on here. So in a Bayesian inference, we have our data that could be our ATs, AGCs, you know, our, our alignments. It could also be some metadata, you know, um, who the host was was it a was it a human? Was it a deer? Was it a, a bird? Right. Um, it could be location, it could be all that kind of bits, bits of data. And then we're developing a model for that data. So that model is made up of multiple parts. And it could be the tree, the shape of the tree is part of that model. Our epidemiological model, so I'm explaining the demographic change over time. So SIR model, et cetera, that could be part of that model. We'd have an evolutionary model. We know certain mutations are more common than other mutations. Uh, we might have a temporal model, right? We might know how quickly mutations happen over time. Does that change over time? We're going to talk about that a little bit more going on. We might, and we can really, the nice thing about this framework is we can kind of fit anything else we want into that as part of the model. We fit in spatial aspects of, you know, how things move and migrate over space. We can build in immune function, right? We can know like this protects against the, you know, infection from this is more likely to protect against this. So we can incorporate some kind of antigenic cartography directly into these models. And so the whole idea of Bayesian inference is being able to calculate what is the probability of a model we've specified given the data we have, right? And so the way we do this is using something called Bayes theorem, um, where we essentially have our likelihood, straight, same, exactly the same idea as our likelihood, so the probability of data given the model we specified, as well as some prior, some prior probabilities. There's some prior information we might build in. We know certain tree shapes are more likely than others. We know certain demographic models are more likely than others. We have lots of data about which mutations occur more often than others. So we might incorporate some of that prior information into our model. We also have an uniform. We can also have a uniform prior, right? We could do this in a way where we're not incorporating lots of technical detail in there. We might just say we want to just be mostly led by the data, but we're gonna we're gonna make our we're gonna be less effective that way. And then we're the denominator here is a nightmare term where we're trying to sum the probability of the data over all possible models. We can't actually calculate this in with most real data sets. So what we do is we do a lot of tricks where we look at the ratio and cancel this term out. And the way the way we actually get these values, the way we work out this this uh, something called a posterior probability distribution, is again whole area in itself. It's a it's generally we use a sampling approach we're using Monte Carlo Markov chains, but we won't go into the depths of that. I just say here this is the likelihood we're going to be talking that was talked about the other day, and the disclaimer is for the actual lab today we're going to be focusing on the subset of these file dynamic methods that actually use these likelihood frameworks by themselves rather than a full Bayesian framework. Unfortunately, the Bayesian methods are great. They're incredibly powerful and incredibly flexible, but they're a little bit unwieldy uh, for the logistics of everyone running this because it involves that random sampling and exploring the space. And it just, it'd be a bit challenging to run in a lab of this size. But if you're interested in this area, there's some links in the lab for to other resources, and particularly uh, the Taming the Beast workshops or like a whole workshop like CBW about using one of these main Bayesian modeling workflows for this kind of genomic epidemiology and file dynamics. So now we've got kind of a very quick introduction to the high level idea of the general concept of file dynamics. Let's look at a couple of specific analyses. Let's look at a couple of the ways we can use that tree to learn about the underlying data set. And just remember in the back of your head, when we're doing this, we're usually we're doing uh, using this in a probabilistic framework to deal with all the uncertainty involved in that blurry view we're getting of the underlying network. So, one example of a problem that we're going to talk about in the lab is knowing when zoonoses happen is kind of key to trying to reduce them. So, zoonoses is when we have a pathogen in another another species, or even in humans, that spills over to a different species, right? So, in this case, you know. Bat SARS-CoV-2 is spilling over to humans, lots of within host transmission in humans. And then we've actually seen spill over in humans to other animals. Some cases, dead end hosts where there's no ongoing infections. Other cases, you know, we see a stable infection. It infects a new creature. Uh, and then we see signs of within host transmission and the establishment of a new reservoir. And this is a nasty problem because it can spill back into humans. So knowing when these zoonotic effects, zoonotic events are occurring helps us identify, you know, uh, knowing where and when, that's the next step we're going to talk about, 
might help us identify interventions that might help reduce these from occurring. But to work out when something happened, we need to be able to convert our tree that's based in distance. So these are substitutions per site. So just a normalized number of mutations by the size of the genome. Um, we need to be able to convert this distance tree to a time tree, right? So we want, we want instead of, we want all these dots to be positioned based on the time rather than, and we want these branch lines to be based on how long a time has occurred rather than how many new changes there's been. And so one of the ways we can do that is we can try to, est we need to estimate the mutation rate. How quickly do mutations happen? And then based on that, we can work out, we got the time associated with all these dots, right? We've sampled them. So we know when we sampled that genome. So we've got points, we've got times for the end, but for these branches, internal branches, we don't know, we don't have any information. We've got to infer them, right? So to do that, we need to work out the mutation rate. How quickly do mutations occur over time? because it's very slow, and we see a lot of mutations, it's going to be a very, very long time. Whereas if mutations rate is very high, we see a lot of mutations in a short time, then our, you know, our even mutation branches that have a lot of mutations on them are going to be relatively short, right? So one of the ways we do this is something called root tip progression. And so the idea here is we're taking the distance between all of these points and the root of the tree, all the way back here, versus the time when they were sampled, and we're making a scatter plot of them, right? So this is that distance from the point all the way back to the, the beginning of the tree, and this is the sampling time. And we can see we get a scatter plot, and we can, we can do kind of simple linear regression here. We can draw a line through this and look at the gradient of that line to work out what that mutation rate is, right? So we see here is 0 0.0041 per year. So that, that lets us infer the mutation rate on this tree uh, in these samples. And then what we can do is we can kind of estimate how long these branches should be based on the time that all these individual genomes were sampled and that mutation rate, right? Again, the long high mutation rate, we're going to have uh, very lots of very short branches potentially, even when they have a lot of changes, a very slow mutation rate. The branches that previously were very long that had lots of mutations on it are going to be potentially very, very long, right? Um, and so what this lets us do is let's take this, take this distance tree and convert it to a time tree. And so the overall shape of the tree, the topology of the tree stays the same, right? We're not changing the topology of the tree, but we're changing the branch lengths to be time calibrated instead of, uh, instead of distance calibrated. And then when we want to work out when, where an event, when an event has occurred in the tree, we can just look at these x-axis here, right? And we could say, okay, so this, uh, this group here split off around uh, you know, late 2011 right, or early 2012, right, we can use that on the x-axis. So we can get an estimate of when these internal nodes that we can't observe actually happened. So say this represents, you know, this represents spillover into, into humans. All these, say, are animal viruses, and this, these are human viruses or bacteria. We can estimate, okay, when did this actually happen? And so a lot of these analyses have been done, again, for the origin of SARS-CoV-2 to try and work out when those initial spillovers occurred. We can infer much more complex models and very like we can do this in a much more sophisticated way. Mutation rates can vary over time. Uh, so we might want to incorporate that. You know, say it spills over and this lineage evolves with higher mutation rate. Maybe we want to calibrate that into the tree. We want to include that in our model. So we can build those more sophisticated models quite easily using these standard probabilistic frameworks. So here is an example of a time tree letting us estimate the timing of an observed event that we're going to use in the lab. So here we see in, uh, in yellow here, we see human infections. And in orange, we see SARS-CoV-2 from deer. So we can see here, it looks like ancestor was human. Something happened here. There was a whole bunch of deer infections and there seems to be a human infection nested within those deer infections. So this might represent a transmission from a human to a deer to a human. So there's a lot of unsampled rev evolution here. There's a lot of things, with uncertainty there. And the nice thing about using the time tree approaches is we can estimate when these things occurred, right? So this, is this branch is approximately a year long. There was a whole year of unobserved infections happening somewhere. Could it be in humans? Could it be in wildlife? We don't know. We weren't observing them. And then when did the spill, you know, when is the ancestor of this? And we're going to dig into more of this data in more detail in the lab. 
Another example is we might also want to know where something happened, right? So that's when something happened, but maybe we want to know where something happened. So an example of this might be we're trying to trace the source of an outbreak. So say we have a, a so say we have a spillover in in sorry we have an outbreak in sorry I was distracted by uh, by Emma mocking mocking the virus name uh, nomenclature standardization. Um, so we might be interested in an outbreak in a hospital, right? And so say we got our tree, we're back to our simple A, B, C, D, E, F tree. And we can, you know, we can use metadata. We can say, where did these, where did these samples get collected? So D was collected in the community. A, B, and C were collected in hospitals. E and F were collected, connected, collected in the community. And so we have a trait, right? We have a piece of information we've got on the tips of the tree again. Just like before, where we had the dates on the tips of the tree, and we want to look back in the tree. We want to work out, okay, where in the tree do you, is it most likely, is the highest posterior probability in the Bayesian framework or high maximum likelihood in the likelihood framework that uh, transmission from community to hospital occurred? We saw that transition in the location trait, right? So this trait here, you know, these are both in the hospital. So here is probably a hospital sample. It's pretty unlikely that this was, we were in the community here and there was two separate infections at the hospital. It looks like this. Similarly here, like all three of these are all hospital samples. So likely the ancestral state back here in the tree is gonna be hospital, right? And when we see a single grouping like this, that suggests a single source, that might be a useful way for us to, you know, identify, okay, a single source that was on, and we can use the time inference, it was on this date, so these were the series of healthcare workers. Maybe we want to check for asymptomatic carriage, right? Uh, maybe they're having the disease and shedding and they're not sick. We might want to check them. We might want to be able to do that. And this infection prevention and control investigations are increasingly using these methods. That's how, you know, that's the infection disease team in hospitals that we're trying to track down the sources of particularly nosocomial hospital inquired infections. Things like MRSA, Candida auris, all that kind of fun. Um, Here's another example, you know, and why we might want to do that reconstruction. So say we see two, we have two hospital samples up here and a hospital sample back here. You know, yeah, this could be a case of there was an ancestral, uh, ancestral, there was an ancestral infection. Uh, you know, there's one transmission to hospital and then people left the hospital and caused infections in the community. That's a possible scenario. But again, in an ideal method, probably the most likely scenario you would expect based on a simple tree like this would be there's two separate introductions into the hospital from the community. In the circular diversity in the community, there's been two separate transmissions into the hospital. So there's hospital one, hospital one. So these two dots here. So we want to be able to infer those internal ancestral states from the observed tips. Much like, you know, we see in those, uh, I see your question, Sydney, it's a great question. I will get to it, I can get to it at the end unless a TA jumps on it first. Um, so we might want to do that observing of those internal states. So we have, say, so this could be AA, could be hospital-based state, and these could be B, they could be physical located in the community. And so we're interested in, you know, the transition between these states. So we might try and reconstruct on the tree the kind of series of changes that happen in the internal branches. And the way we do this is we usually develop some form of continuous time Markov chain or some form of kind of some kind of probabilistic inference like that, where we have some degree of understanding of what is the rate of the different changes. You know, is it much, far more likely for someone to leave to, from one of the community to enter the hospital or someone in the community to leave the hospital and cause an infection in the community? Which is a more likely pattern? Uh, it depends on the particular trait we're interested in, depending on the data we have. Um, and we, what we're going to use, we're going to use this transition probability, these rates that we're either both inferring from the tree and or inferring from prior, we're, we're tuning based on prior information we have to try and infer these internal states in the tree. So here, the probability is most likely this internal node was physically within the hospital, right? This was probably a genome, represents a genome we did sample that would have been within the hospital. Whereas back here, it's more likely to be the uh, in the community. There are lots of different approaches, again, we can do for this internal inference of ancestral states. We use parsimony approach, 
you know, one you know, dollar parsimony is an example used a lot for certain genomic things where it's more likely if something happens, it's fairly unlikely it, it reverts, right? So once a mutation or a gene fusion happens, say back here, it's fairly unlikely it's going to split apart again. Once you get transmission to a hospital, it's, you know, maybe it's unlikely you're going to get people moving back to a community or moving to a particular type of the community, like long-term care or something like that. Might use maximum likelihood approaches. Again, moving back on the tree, same idea. And that's what we're going to use in the lab. Or we might use these big Bayesian modeling approaches, right? So again, I know this is fairly light on details, and that's mostly just because of the amount of time we have to dedicate to covering a wide area. But the key idea to take away from this is we can use information about the tips of the tree. So states or characters or traits we have associated metadata we have associated with those tips, especially if they're all nice and organized metadata following things like Emma's module. Um, and we can use that, we can use probabilistic frameworks to infer what the status of that character, that trait was earlier on in the tree, right? Where we weren't able to observe it. So there's plenty of examples of this being used. So this is a really nice example of one of the big early, uh, one of the big Zika papers. And it basically is trying to trace back where Zika originated. Where did the spillover in causing a human disease first like, occur for Zika? They did spatial trait reconstruction here, moving all the way back up the tree and find out that, uh, you know, it most likely originated in Northeast Brazil, right? So they can and reconstruct those internal states in the tree. Um, you know, these, these, this kind of, especially these geographic models, you might off, we will often incorporate some understanding of geography, right? We're talking about, you know, we're talking about, you know, here when we're, we're parameterizing these transition matrices and the priors on them, maybe we're going to incorporate geographic distance into that, right? Or how commonly people take flights between these two countries, right? We can use that migratory, we can use that demographic information to parameterize how likely some of these changes are. You know, far more people, you know, say, come to Canada, then go to Mauritania. So from Mauritania, right? So it's more likely people will move from Mauritania to Canada than people from Canada will go to Mauritania. So we can use some of these things to parameterize these models. And that's exactly this Zika, this phylogeographic model. And you see spatial temporal, you see the time inference as well, is exactly what this does. And this is really a nice gold standard example of this kind of analysis and this kind of reconstruction. The other thing is you don't have to just use, you know, uh, as I alluded to a little bit with when I talk about gene fusion, you don't have to just use um, geography on these trait tips, right? You can use exactly the same approach to infer, say, mutations and when did mutations occur within the tree. So we have associated with all these tips, we have, okay, all of these have the A mutation, but they, all of these have the B mutation. And we can reconstruct the, these internal nodes, again, that we didn't observe directly. We can reconstruct, you know, what was the most likely mutation at these internal nodes. And so we can find the first one above our threshold or criteria and try and infer when did that mutation first occur in the tree. So when did that mutation occur? Maybe that's the evolution of new uh, immune evasion. Maybe that's the evolution of... Um, higher transmission rate. Maybe it's jumping and uh, adapting to a new host, right? So we can infer ancestral traits on the tree using the same idea of ancestral state reconstruction. Okay, so that's kind of the, the spatial and temporal aspect. And again, very high level. And check out that Taming the Beast workshop for far more detail on this. Um, but what about, you know, I was talking about epidemiological parameters at the beginning. I was talking about epidemiology. How do we, how do we access some of those kind of classic epidemiological modeling parameters using our tree. So, so again, here's the idea is, you know, one of, the, one of the aspects when we're looking at number of cases, and often as a denominator in all those models is essentially the pathogen population size, the effective population size of the pathogen or its structure. And so is there a way we can use some, look at the genomes, then look at the phylogeny, try and infer how much pathogen there was at a given time. And this gives us an idea of, you know, how many of the actual cases did we observe? How much asymptomatic carriage was there that we just never actually managed to identify? And so one of the really nice properties is the shape of a given tree actually relates to the population size and the underlying structure. So you see here for a relatively small population size, we'll probably see this kind of almost series of essentially their founder effects, right? We're seeing 
know, there's a little bit of diversity and then these, they form the basis of this next bit of diversity and then they form the basis of this next bit of diversity. Whereas the other hand, if we have a very large population size, we see a more drift-like pattern over time, right? You know, it's a very large population. There'll be a bit of selection going on in there and selection will change the shape even further and there'll be another layer we add on. But the shape of the tree, you know, when we see a very large population size, we'll kind of form this kind of gradual expansion and dribble, dribble down because there's not any, the structure of the population is not imposing a bunch of constraints on the demography. So again, don't necessarily need to remember exactly how, exactly the exact patterns we see here, but the general idea is the shape of the tree relates to population size. Why is that the case? What, what is that actual relationship? So one of the ways we can access that, especially in this kind of modeling world of file dynamics is some, using things called coalescent processes. So say we've got two trees here. So this is the tree when it's cold. This is what the tree looks like when there's a constant population size over time, when the viral population is not getting any bigger over time. And the red bits are the genomes we sampled, right? Whereas here we have what the population, what the tree, what the shape of the tree would look like if we had a growing population. So if the number of pathogens, genomes were increasing over time, the number of pathogens out there, and the amount of diversity in the pathogens increasing over time. And so we use something called a coalescent process to try to model that. So this is a big complex, uh, it looks like a big complex scary figure, but really all it is is basically we say, you know, if we have these genomes, these red genomes we sampled, and so this, the width of these, these dots, so these dots represent the population of the virus, right? So this given time, you know, there's, you know, this is a very small population we're showing, so it's 20 odd, something like, I don't know, can count, can count, quick, count quickly while presenting. And we've sampled these three genomes from that population. So we can move backwards in the tree and go, okay, what's the probability that each of the, each pair of these is going to share a common ancestor each generation? And the probability that any two genomes are going to share a common ancestor is based on the number of possible ancestors there were, right? Um, so, you know, here, these two, we say you know, we have a kind of random walk back over time, and we can see, you know, by this point, they're likely to have coalesced. They're relatively close genomes. So this population size, they're going to have a coalescent point in the past here. And that's going to be that internal node on that tree, essentially. And so how quickly we see that coalescent, how quickly they are likely to share a common ancestor is based on how wide this population size is, how big the population size at each given time point. So each of these time points is representing a simplifying assumption of an, a distinct non-overlapping generation. So here's generation one, and then all the viruses very cleanly have a second generation. Here's the second generation and so on and so forth. In reality, it doesn't look like this, but it's an assumption we're going to deal with for now. And will makes our maths a lot simpler for these things. So the coalescent process is literally just one based over n, right? The, the how likely they are to coalesce to, to any two genomes is based on how big the population size is at that time. So when we see a population size like this, we can see the coalescent pattern is going to be different, right? Because they're, the population size is decreasing. So the likelihood they're going to coalesce actually increases. The pro probability increases because it's the inverse of the population size. So we see a shorter tree, a stubbier branches. And so we can use, there's a, there's a statistic called genomes D we can use to measure deviation from neutrality, the, from how neutral in terms of selection, in terms of population change over time is. The genomes D is kind of a measure of whether we see an increasing population size or a decreasing population size. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of extension. Uh, I see a quick question from Alan in the chat. There's a, quick, there's a lot of extensions to this kind of model and a coalescent approach. Particularly, that's used a lot in human genomics, right? When you have sexual reproduction, that adds a whole bunch of complexity and mixing. Um, again, very wide area. I'm giving a very high level overview to in a very short amount of time. Um, again, so taming the beast, again, we'll go into a lot more detail about these coalescent processes and how to use them. But the general idea is we can use the shape of the tree to infer things like the population size of the underlying pathogen based on things called coalescent processes. Okay, so on to our last, our last aspect of file dynamics um, is, and that's looking at evolutionary forces such as selection. So how do we measure whether selection is occurring on a tree? So one of the classic, oh, in a genome. So one of the classic ways in which we do this is something called DNDS. 
what DNDS is, it's the ratio of non-synonymous mutations, so it's mutations that don't cause a change in the protein, to synonymous mutations. And both of these have to be normalized by the number of opportunities there are in the genome for synonymous mutations and non-synonymous mutations, because they're not equal. Um, the general thought thinking is here is if we see about equal numbers of these both, if we say about equal numbers of normalized synonymous and non-synonymous mutations, it probably represents drift. We're probably not seeing any sign of strong selection going on in the genome because they're kind of gradually occurring over time and we're seeing the same number of mutations proportionally that change the protein and don't change the protein. And this is under the slightly sketchy assumption that synonymous mutations don't have much of an impact on fitness. There is some, especially things like viruses, they likely do have some degree of an effect just because of the very compact genome. They change things like how, you know, codon frequencies and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, and there's a lot of debate on the Shen paper in terms of yeast recently. There's a, there's been a big uh, critique of it, a uh, letter published recently. But for the assumption and simplicity of what we're dealing with today, let's assume synonymous mutations don't cause a selection effect. So when we see equal numbers proportionally of non-synonymous synonymous mutations, it's probably reflective of drift. There's no strong selection going on. If we see more non-synonymous mutations, so more mutations that change the protein, and synonymous mutations, it's probably a sign that positive selection is going on, right? The evolution, we're actively selecting and retaining and fixing mutations that are changing the proteins, more so than mutations that don't change the proteins. And the opposite, maybe we have a very stable thing and any mutation that changes the protein is gonna cause, uh, it's gonna cause the pathogen to become less fit. Um, we might see negative, this ratio being less than one, for example, purified or negative selection. So the only mutations that are allowed to kind of be retained in the population are these non-synonymous mutations. But, okay, so we have DNDS ratios and we can kind of look into this and we can look at the DNDS ratios and genomes. So what, why do we need phylogenies for looking at this? And what are some of the challenges of that? Well, one of the challenges is mutation rates vary over time in groups. I talked about that earlier a bit in the temporal models, but depending on which part of the tree we're on, mutations are more like, are gonna occur faster there's going to be more higher mutation rate or lower mutation rates. Um, and that's going to affect our, these estimates. Similarly, across the genome, mutation rates are going to vary. There's going to be some parts of the genome that mutate far more often than others, synonymously or non-synonymous, right? And again, this is just related to the underlying biological process. It's determining how mutations are occurring. And then finally, the big one, and the one I kind of really want to you guys to take away today, because it's a very common mistake in analysis of biological data, be machine, all from machine learning, statistics, epidemiology, is genomes are related. Biological things are related to one another. So mutations and things like that are not independent events. They're non-independent. Therefore, you need to, they're not IID. You need to incorporate that dependency structure into your model. Otherwise, all your error terms are going to be messed up and likely wrong. What do I mean by this? So say we have, again, our, our, our fun six genomes, our A, B, C, D, E, and F. We have synonymous mutations and non-synonymous mutations, so synonymous in purple, synonymous in uh, orange. We can just count the number of non-synonymous synonymous mutations in each of these genomes. So there's two purple in A, one orange, one non-synonymous in A. Uh, D has only one synonymous mutation. F has two non F has two synonymous, one synonymous mutation. If we just naively took this and calculate the ratios, the DNDS ratios, when we normalize them. Um, I'm cautious of this guy messed it up for publicly. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna, and we ignore the phylogeny, we're gonna overcount some of these mutations. So see, we've counted these two mutations here, so mutation E and mutation F, as separate mutations that we just tally naively. But this is all just one mutation. So the same mutation is just present in A and is oh, it should be okay. I've messed that up again. So pre, we're just saying so this one mutation is occurring in this part of the tree, it just happens to be present in two genomes. It doesn't mean the same mutations happen twice. So that again, we can use an ancestral inference to look at internal states here, but we need to use the tree again here. So we A, B, and C, all this purple mutation, this no synonymous mutation occurred in the ancestor, common ancestor of A, B, and C. So we're actually counting this three as three different mutations if we just tally the genomes when it's only one mutation. That mutation only occurred once. So we're going to hugely overestimate the number of mutations unless we use the underlying phylogenetic structure. So what a phylogeny does in this case is it captures the dependency structure of the genomic data. And so it informs the error transfer models. And so in the lab, we're going to use something called 
the adaptive branch like random effects likelihood model, bit of a mouthful, which just tests and controls for all these aspects of, is there a significant proportion of sites, so positions in alignment, within selected branches that have a DNDS ratio greater than one? So is there a subset of branches in our tree that have signatures of positive selection? And we're going to dive into that a bit more in detail uh, in the lab. So an example of this and the kind of last example we're going to talk about today was a uh, paper of uh, Kagania. It's actually one of the one of the people uh, in the in the uh, workshop actually led is looking at when we treat pa patients with remdesivir, an antiviral that interrupts uh, viral replication, do we see signs of, um, and we have shortened courses. So when people don't complete their full recommended course of this antiviral, do we actually select for antiviral resistance mutations? Do we see selection for mutations that cause resistance from remdesivir in the individuals that didn't complete their course? So we build a big phylogeny and we have all the purple branches. We have the individuals that had shortened remdesivir courses. And we have the time points, they have them when they're sampled. And we can ask in the orange branches, do we see signatures of a DNDS ratio greater than one in a significant proportion of sites? So we can test directly our inference, our hypothesis of, yes, we might, we, we you know, we, we think short and remdesivir courses leads to uh, selection for resistance mutations. We might use this file dynamic approach, use some of the to, to, to actually directly test that hypothesis. And so there's a great tool called HiFi, Hypothesis in Phylogenetics, that we're going to dive into in the lab that lets us do lots of different ways of testing for selection using trees, using the underlying phylogenetic structure to make sure we don't kind of goof up and miscount things and overcount things. So in today's lecture, we talked about the ways in which pathogen evolution epidemiologically and intrinsically linked. A phylogenetics, phylogenies are structured by sampling ecology, evolution, and epidemiology of the underlying process. So phylogeny is a way that gives us a blurry view into the underlying epidemiological process that determines the transmission network. It also gives us a way to access insights into evolution and unobserved events. So we can use similarities and differences between genomes to try and infer things we can't directly observe or can't easily directly observe. File dynamics in general tends to be heavily based on Bayesian file genetic models. Um, we are going to use likelihood models in the lab. Sorry about that. And we can use these approaches, Bayesian or otherwise, to do many things and understand many things about our, the epidemiology of our pathogen and the underlying epidemiological process. We can reconstruct transmission networks. We can infer the time and location of outbreaks and events. We can identify when mutation, certain mutations occur. We can determine the values for certain epidemiological parameters. And we can test for evolutionary things like selection. Um, so yeah, that is that is the overview of that is the the whistle stop tour of file dynamics.